Hi, my name is Craig Richardson and welcome to Mind to Heart. In this show, we take a journey from our logical, critical mind to the powerful heart center where real transformation occurs. My guests help us understand our journeys by telling us about their paths and lessons they've learned along the way. They say that God is love and that we are made to love. It's the greatest experience we can have here on the earth plane. And from testimonies of those who have had near-death experiences, it's the most awesome part of the other side as well. Yet as the famous proverb notes, every rose has its thorns. Closely related to love is suffering. The two inevitably go hand in hand. And the more we open ourselves up for love, the greater and the depth of the suffering. The Christian faith is predicated on a concept that God's only begotten son died for us. Suffering is intrinsically linked to the story of Jesus. And there's nothing more powerful than the Michelangelo sculpture of the Pieta, which shows the Blessed Virgin Mary holding her son moments after his crucifixion. And what could represent both sides of love more powerfully than a mother cradling a deceased child? My guest today is no stranger to the rose of love and the thorns of suffering. In 2005, she was merrily going on with her life until one tragic day when she came home to find her former husband, Steve, dead after taking his own life. It sent her into a spiral and she experienced PTSD as a result. She used the experience, however, to turn her life around, to discover a wonderful spiritual awakening and to begin to help others who face similar traumas. She became an author and a grief coach and has helped countless people endure the loss of loved ones. And again, things were going well until September 2019, when her second husband, Jerry, died unexpectedly. She had to rely heavily on her own grief strategies to once again make it through. Here to share her experiences and to talk to us about love, grief, and overcoming loss is my guest, Robin Chodak. She's also written a book, Be Gentle With Me, I'm Grieving, which we'll hear about as well. Robin, welcome to Mind to Heart. Hello, Craig. Thank you, Craig, for having me on your show. I really appreciate being here with you, and I appreciated that beautiful introduction. And just to, to say, when you talked about Christ and the child and the love and the suffering, I just want to say that I echo that exactly because I believe that the more that you love, the more and the greater your suffering will be. And I would just like to say to everyone that's joining in today, thank you for being here with us. And I am very sorry for any of the losses that you have encountered in your life. I'm glad you're here. I believe that you are here for a reason with us because <laughs> we are always giving and receiving messages. And I hope that this interview will bring you some solace and begin your journey of transformation. Well, thank you too, Robin. It's great having you here and, and what, a, what a story and I'm, I'm looking forward to getting into it. So uh, I'd like to start back in 2005, uh, you may, maybe give a little bit of background as to what, you know, where you were in your life and then, and then you know, bring us to that, to that tragic day that when, when you discovered Steve. Wow, <laughs> that, uh, that's a big story. But actually in, in my book, that I wrote, Be Gentle With Me, I'm Grieving. I talked a lot about my prior life before Steve. And I didn't really get to work on my past grief and losses until his death. So that's interesting what happens. A lot of time, grief is just stuffed down. It's not processed. And it's not until you experience something very traumatic that you're able to move in and begin to process that grief. So for me, my childhood was, it was difficult. I, I didn't have a father present all the time. So I was uh, the oldest and I took care of my siblings. Mm -hmm. I, you know, was the mom at like 12, 13 years old. And it was tough. My mom worked to support us and what ended up happening to me is I found myself with child, as we could say, or, yeah. or pregnant 
unwed at 16. And I, that was actually my first grief experience because it was then that I realized at 15 that every choice I make is going to have a consequence. And here I am at 15 years old. What do you do? What do you do with that kind of situation and experience? And, and my mom, she was just such a great, great influence. She said, she, she said, these are your choices. There's abortion, there's adoption, there's you marry the father, you stay at home with me. We have the baby. Well, I chose to marry the father. Mm. He was willing. And so I, I did what I could. I became a mom at 16. And so that was a whole experience, a whole, whole lifetime. I grieved my childhood. I was going to say, I think one of the biggest things out of that, and anybody who grew up in a, in a, in a non-ideal situation, particularly in yours, where you were thrown into being one of the parents, sounds to me, and maybe you're still working through this, but you know, the first thing, the most significant thing is grieving the loss of a childhood. You never had one. Right, exactly. So there was a lot of, the, the point I'm making is there is a lot of loss, but I didn't really begin to, I mean, I worked through a lot of it, you know, as I you know, grew older, but when Steve died by suicide, that's when I revisited everything. And so I ended up ending that marriage. And then later I met Steve, who was my soulmate and everything was just, you know, hunky dory, beautiful, euphoric, right? Right. We had a couple years together and then he gets diagnosed with cancer. Oh, so. Now, Prior to Steve, and I want to talk about this loss as well, because this is very significant. So prior to Steve dying, I also lost my sister. Ugh. She was 16 when she was diagnosed with bone cancer. Wow. And she survived for four years. Now, I was already married and out of the house. So again, that was a situation where I had what they called a delayed grief. So I didn't process that grief till much to many years later. So now here I am already so much grief. And then all of a sudden I felt like, wow, God has given me a, a second chance in life. I meet this man. I'm so happy. It's what I thought life should be, right? Mm -hmm, well, exactly. then he gets diagnosed with cancer. Well, then that's a whole new, you know, you can just have one show talking about cancer, okay? And what people go through and all the emotions and everything else, you can dedicate one show. So I'll just sum it up. I mean, <laughs> it was a very difficult time. We didn't think he was gonna live. They did not expect him to survive. He went through radiation, chemotherapy, full body radiation, head to toe, and a bone marrow transplant back in 2005. Now, that I believed really changed him. Okay, so he, he, they expected him to be dead in yeah. three years. Well, guess what? He beat the odds. He was alive five years later. Wow. But, and then you would say, people would say to themselves, well, gosh, what a great story. This man, you know, everything he did is 40s. He survived this cancer. He's a statistic. And you would think, wow, life is, is great. Well, he began to get depressed, kind of hid it from me to a degree. I, I believe that a lot of it had to do with the therapies. I mean, I don't know. I'll never know. We will never know. That's part of the process. That's acceptance of why he did what he did. So after, you know, about four years after the treatment, he's still alive. He started the treatment in 1999, still alive in 2005, wasn't able to work. He was on permanent disability. He was in a, a psychotherapy program. He had just started it three weeks before he died. He wasn't feeling good one day. 
I noticed changes in him. I got very worried. He was pacing around, very, very worried about him. I called my primary care back then. They could not, you cannot admit a patient to the hospital. He had to admit himself. He said he wasn't feeling right. He wanted to get help. He says, I don't feel right. right. I want to get help. I said, okay, great. Let's go to the hospital. And we went into the psych ward and they admitted him. They kept him in for two days. He came home. Two weeks later, he had killed himself. And I was the one to find him in our basement. I immediately fell into a state of shock. I don't even know how I, I actually crawled, crawled up the basement stairs and hung out my door like a marionette doll until, and, and couldn't even, the voice, I couldn't even get the words out. And if anybody has been through this experience, they know what I'm talking about. You, you, your, your whole body, your mind, everything goes into the state of shock and you just, you almost black out. But for some reason, you know, I was able to crawl, crawl, like a, like yeah, a- It puts you in a state of shock, really. I mean, you're in yeah. a state, I mean, if you've ever been in a car accident, all that, so you, you, you sort of, you, you're, you go on autopilot, I guess. That's all, you, cause you can't- Yes, function. exactly, exactly right. You, you know, there, you don't know how you do these things and how you survive, but you do. And then my neighbor came and he was able to, you know, call the police and, everything. And I, I just did, I couldn't, I didn't, couldn't believe he was gone. It was just such a shock because here was a man that was fighting for his life. Right. And so it was, there was, there's so many, you know, this is considered a complicated grief. I don't know if you know this, there are at least right now we have defined like 17 different types of grief. This is falls in the range of a complicated grief and a traumatic grief. Yeah, yeah. So this was the type of grief that I had to deal with. And I know there's gonna be many people watching this because I have a whole following of suicide survivors and and, and they can relate to this. Yeah, they, they, it's, so, it's so hard on the people that are you know obviously left behind. And, and we're gonna take our first break here in a couple minutes, uh, seconds here, but... Um, when I get when we get back, I'd like to maybe pick up there and then get into, you know, what obviously how that impacted you. You know, you mentioned PTSD in in the summary, and then most importantly in the next segment, you know, how what steps you took to start climbing out. So we'll we'll pick up there uh, in our next segment when we get back. Hi, welcome back to Mind to Heart with your host, Craig Richardson, and I'm delighted to have my guest, Robin Chodak, here, who is telling us a, a lot about her uh, grief and her tragedies growing up. Um, it seems to really have defined part of who she is, uh, and she just uh, discussed prior to the break how she discovered her former husband, Steve, uh, when he had committed suicide. So, Robin, I'd like to pick up sort of in the aftermath of that, um, you know, you mentioned specifically the, the, the day you found it, but, you know, talk to us about, you, you mentioned the, the PTSD. I mean, talk to us sort of what, what occurred and then, and then how you kind of crawled out of that. Yeah. So at the time I was working as a computer systems analyst, writing computer code. That was my job for 25 years. And my brain just, wasn't working as it should. I just, I couldn't think, I couldn't, I, I couldn't imagine even trying to go back to work. So I was fortunate to be able to take a leave of absence from my job. And that was when I really had the time, the time to process some things. Uh, and, and I went through the the typical you know, the, the Kubler-Ross steps that we call them, you know, the, the oh, anger. The five steps or whatever they're called. Yes, the five steps, you know, the anger, the denial. Actually, those steps were written for the person dying. Oh, I don't know if any, a lot of people don't know that. No, I always it, thought it was, the, you know, going through a heartbreaker, no, usually the, the ones I think of when you get dumped or something, but. Right, but then they, you know, they were able to be transferred onto us because we go through the, the exact same st stages as the, the person that's dying and knows they're going to die. They go through those 
those steps, the oh, anger, wow. the denial, you know, the depression, and then finally the acceptance. And so that's what I had to do. I had to work through that. And I just remember, I mean, the pivotal, the pivotal time was I struggled a lot with my, my, my faith and my belief system because Steve and I were very active in our church. We, you know, we had this belief system and, and I felt that the church, they looked down upon this then. Things have changed, but it was, it was as if they viewed that Steve would not go to that place that we call heaven, okay? Because he committed suicide. Because he, yes, he took his own life and the church doesn't, you know, agree with that idea. So right. that was very hard for me because here I was this woman of faith and, and, I, and, and Steve believed in God. I believed in God. We believe in the afterlife. And I'm thinking, I, I can't embrace this idea. Steve is not going to this place called hell. I mean, he right. was more like Jesus than most people. <laughs> yeah. So that, that, that was the beginning. I had to begin to challenge my belief systems. And that was the, the key, the key, because they weren't serving me anymore. That thought of him just burning in hell was making my life worse. It wasn't helping my recovery. So as you move, you want to be moving in a way that you're, you're helping your recovery, not things that are dragging you down. So I just remember I, I would walk. Every day I would walk, I walk, I walk. I, I say, I, I felt like, what was that movie with the guy walking all the time? Um, well, Forrest Gump ran. I, he yeah. ran. Oh, right. He, Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump, right. right. When, right. when, when exactly. Jenny, he lost Jenny or the, you know, she left or whatever. <laughs> he, he ran for three years or something. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, I was like, I, I wasn't running, but I was walking. I, I would walk six miles a day. I actually walked to Steve's grave three oh. miles and I'd sit there. I'd talk to him. I'd yell at him. I'd laugh with him. I'd cry with him. <laughs> And then I'd walk three miles home. But that was the time. It was this, this transformative time because I just remember saying to God, I want you to do a lobotomy on my head. I want you to take everything out, every belief that I've had, everything that doesn't serve me. And I want you to begin to fill it with new stuff. And I just allow that to happen. And lo and behold, it's amazing how these things work. Everything was just coming to me. Things did, you that ever I get, did you ever get mad at God? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, I said, hey, God could take it. I'm not going to serve a God who can't take that, right? <laughs> I well, mean, I was thinking, I mean, and you mentioned earlier, you know, not only with Steve, but you, you, all the things that you had to deal with. I mean, did you, find, did you, did you have a pity party and say, why, why are you doing this to me? I'm trying to be a good person. I'm trying to follow the follow the tenets of the faith and this is this is how you treat me well i you know to a degree i did but i guess i felt more like i was part of this collectiveness and i wasn't the only one suffering mm -hmm. and, and and i i felt part of the whole okay and so many people were suffering and i and i watched my sister suffer as right. a young girl and she was like an angel she never said why me she was my greatest teacher. Mm -hmm. she, she suffered for four years and I never heard her say, why me? Why me, God? So she was a teacher for me. Wow. She had wow. all these mentors. And, and like I said, this is, there was so much suffering and I wasn't gonna single myself out. Like this is the worst because everybody else suffered as well. And I felt like we just needed to join together to try to help one another. And, and well, and I do think too, as I talked in the intro, um, that, that when you clear away sort of the church hierarchy, that is ultimately the message of Jesus on the cross. I mean, you talk about somebody who, I mean, that's always been intricately linked to, you know, that faith in others um, is that this concept of suffering and it, 
for, for whatever reason, and maybe we can figure it out a little bit more when we get on the other side, it is, you know, and as you experience in your life, it's where ultimately the transformations occur without that, you wouldn't have had the opening and awakening that you did. Right, right. So, so another belief. So uh, again, like all these beliefs that I had, I'm talking religious, political, anything, any belief, they were all going down by the wayside, filling my mind and heart. Okay, spirit with new. And one of the things that helped me begin to live my life again and realize that my life was worth living was a quote that I came across by Gottfried Leibniz, hmm. German philosopher. And he said, to love is to delight in another person's happiness. Hmm. And so I began to think about my beliefs about love. So we all have an idea about love. We, we, you know, we can say, oh, it's a romantic love. It's a friendship love. It's an agape love. It's an, a God love. It's an eternal love. And I thought, wait a minute, what do I believe about love? Mm. Well, I do believe it's eternal. It's an energy that doesn't die. So I said to myself, Steve and I had this amazing love on so many levels. So just because he is no longer in the physical, he's in the non-physical, he would be delighted if I'm in love with life, Yeah. in love with myself, in love with my friends, in love with others, okay? So this is delighting him because this is an energy an uh, eternal energy of love. And so just coming to that realization myself, it, it just really changed me. And well, I, I think that's pretty profound. I mean, I think as I describe the other side of that, sort of the pity party, I think they're related in that when love becomes all about you, you know, the feelings that you get and how, you know, putting all your eggs in the basket of the other person in, in you know, almost a codependent kind of thing, you know, the, the flip side happens too, when that's taken away and it sort of all becomes, comes all about you. And I think what you discovered is that, no, it, like you said, it's God is love. God is, it is universal. And, 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 and that's a, and that's a difficult, that's, that's having to tamp the ego down and actually get out into what is really what we're called to do. Yes. Yes. And, 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 and my belief is Steve, all, all my loved ones. Okay. They're no longer here in the physical but they're in, they're in the non-physical and they're, this non-physical exists. All, it's, it's always here, it's always with us, but we're human and we just live our life going about kind of like you said earlier on autopilot and we live in the physical realm because we are physical beings. But when you begin to tap into this, like I have, you experience the non-physical in a new way. So I have a relationship with my, my deceased loved ones. Well, right now, my current relationship is mostly with Jerry because he just passed less than, it's gonna be two years. And so, you know, this is the relationship. And I mean, obviously I still have it with Steve, but now the one with Jerry is taking precedence because this is my most recent loss and my most recent love. But I have these relationships, they communicate. We, we communicate, we're always gonna have them this is right. the energy I'm talking about. This is the energy of love. This is tapping into that non-physical reality. Yeah, that's that's very powerful. And uh, we're going to take a break here again uh, in a few uh, moments. Um, I, I want to get into, as, as you started getting into sort of the spiritual awakening, which is beautiful, um, that, that you had and discovered. Um, <clears throat> and then how, and I think, and I guess I know partly now because you've discussed this power of love, but how, so, how that you felt that, not only were you personally having this awakening, but that you were going to help others that had come in, in where you became, uh, you know, you did some writings, you were an author, and then, you know, became a grief coach. So when we get back, I want to get into that a little bit about how you, how you made that. And, and I can, and I can obviously tell that that had a big, you know, helping others is always a way for us to help ourselves. So when we get back, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Hi, welcome back to Mind to Heart with your host, Craig Richardson, and I'm delighted to begin to have Robin Chodak here, who has 
regaled us with her stories of, of tragedy and, 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 and hope. And I think those are the two that, that really go together and that can really define her life. She, she described beautifully how in her transformation, she was able to open up and understand that love is universal, that it's not something personal and that that's really helped her along. And Robin, before the break, uh, I mentioned that it'd be nice to now to discuss how in the aftermath of your own awakening, how you discovered that your calling was to help others as well. Can you walk us through a little bit of that and how that happened and what you did? Yes, absolutely. I, well, first of all, after Steve died, I started writing. I was journaling and that is very, very therapeutic. That's one of the things I always teach and recommend to my clients because it's a way to just really get things out, okay? Those deep, deep things. And I, I started writing and actually the, the writings were initially letters to Steve. Uh. I wrote every night to him a letter and it was just me speaking to him, talking to him, telling him my feelings. And then later I started writing about our life together. And so now I'm recalling all the wonderful moments. And so it was very therapeutic and very good. And then I realized I wanted to put this into a book. So I started a, mem a memoir, which is not really published yet, but that was okay because it was meant for me to write the book about be gentle with me, I'm grieving. And I specifically wrote that book because as I, as I process my grief and work through the suicide, I, I went to suicide support groups. I, I actually became a suicide facilitator later on but I needed the support, okay? When you have a, a tragedy and a, a, a traumatic grief, you need the support. So I am an advocate of support groups. I highly recommend them. They're necessary. Either, you, you know, any kind of support. I don't, it's a life coach, like a grief coach, like myself, a priest, a support group, anybody, you need that support, okay? Especially after a traumatic grief. So anyway, I started, you know, to do this writing and that was very therapeutic. And then I just began realizing that, you know what, there's other people like me mm. that, that can benefit from writing and doing these things that I, that I learned, especially about our belief systems. And then beginning to think differently, think in new ways, think about love, examine your beliefs. What do you believe about love? Okay, so I was learning these things along the way on my journey and I put them in the book, but the book about Be Gentle With Me, I'm Grieving, I felt at the time in 2005, there was not the suicide awareness that there is today. And I, back then, I called churches. I called places. I could not find support. Yeah, it was, it was still kind of taboo even then. It was, you know, because of what you said, the doctrine of the church is that that's a no-no and right. people didn't want to talk about it. So, so it was very difficult. And I finally found, you're going to appreciate this. I finally found something presented by Catholic charities. Oh, wow. And I called and I said, well, I'm not Catholic. Can I come? <laughs> Will you support me? And uh, yes, and this was a wonderful man, Father Ruby, in Chicago, who, who, who's kind of spearheaded the whole support group for suicide survivors. Mm. So, because we, we as, as a survivor, we felt very, very misunderstood. Like no one could really understand what we were going through unless, you know, they went through it themselves. And I <laughs> you never wish that on, upon anyone, but I realized along my journey that people would say, and do inappropriate things. And it was only because they weren't educated on how to right. deal with the grieving. And so therefore, you know, I realized early on, it was up to me to forgive them, you know, and for- yeah, they were probably scared too and indoctrinated with the same stuff and, you know. And yeah, it's really hard. And, and, and forgiveness is, is a big part of any recovery program. Anytime you're moving through and transforming, you know, forgiveness is necessary. And, and there's these, you know, everybody's heard of PTSD. Right. Okay. Well, a lot of people haven't heard of PTG. 
And I talk about this in my books and my online courses. So PTG stands for post-traumatic growth. Now this was coined in the 1990s by two psychologists from the University of North Carolina, Tedeschi and Calhoun. So they studied, you know, war victims and things like this. And they realized that there were people that actually elevated, transformed after a traumatic experience. And so you say, well, how does that happen? Well, I can tell you because it's happened to me, but there's, there's indicators, okay? So, so for instance, they look for five things. They look for what is your appreciation for life now? like okay so once you have this appreciation for life that's an indicator you're on your way to transforming growth they look at your relationships how are your relationships well i'll tell you for me i was so grateful that i had the people still in my life Mm -hmm. that i had a mother that i had a father that i had a daughter granddaughter you know these people my friends it's like you had this uh, this, this gratitude for the people yep. that are still here because you just lost someone. And then, and then they look at your personal, your, your personal strength, okay? So you realize that, wow, I've got the strength now. Where is this coming from? You know, uh, you know I, I'm, it's like, wow. And, it, and for me, yeah, it comes from inside. It comes from that spiritual, that divine, that divinity within us. And then we have that, that transformation. We have that spiritual transformation. So that's what PTG. Yeah, that's that's very powerful. And again, I, you know, I mentioned this in the last segment. So I, I do think that the, the biggest challenge to all of that is to get ourselves away from our own ego or whatever you want to describe that. Because I do think that human nature initially, when anything like that happens, is why me? You know, what, what did I do to deserve this? And I, what was that book that somebody good when good thing bad things happen to good people like there was that was a big thing for a while and yeah and and i think what's remarkable about your story is that you were able to and maybe i'm sure you had those moments but that that what you allowed it to do is to open yourself up like you just said to the divine within and and i think that's a message that's very powerful with people because you know i know i've seen people that who've lost you know children and all that and you know they're they're shell-shocked they don't know what to do yes yes well my mom i mean she lost her daughter Right. I lost my sister. And yo, absolutely. This is part, this is the normal part. You will say, why me? I mean, you, you will, but you're not, it's a matter of, you can speak it, but are you going to live it? Yeah. Okay. Are you going to become the victim? But of course, it's the normal process in grief. You just like, you're, you are put into a, a, a tailspin and you go into shock and, and, and yeah, this is not your life. This is not what you wanted. And you're angry. And this is part of the normal process, but you know, as, as you begin to move and process your grief, and if you want that transformation, you know, you, you, you talk about, and I forgot the one, I didn't, it's the other f- fifth thing they look at is new possibilities. So now you believe that you can have, there's new possibilities in your life. And that is so true. So what I teach is that, yes, there are new possibilities, but you know what? You have to do the work you have to go out there and begin to create your new identity, okay? So now here I am again. And believe me, when my husband, Dr. Gerald Chodak, who was a doctor, you know, died in our home, no, no signs of sickness. I, I said to God, I said, are you kidding me? Hmm. Didn't you, you wanted, you, you took two husbands from me, okay? I well, mean, and a what, sister, and a sister in a childhood, but. <laughs> yes, you know, it's like, are you kidding? But, but again, it's, it's like, see, I, I understand that there's, there's more, okay? This is the reality of what happened. They're gone. I still have a, I have a non-physical relationship with them. I'm still here in the physical. I have a purpose. I have friends and family that I still want to have relationship with here. And I want to live the best that I can now. Okay, every day I wake up and I say, thank you, God. I'm surrounded with nature. Nature is very healing. Yeah, it's powerful. Advocate of that. And I just, and you have an attitude of gratitude and you don't, you don't stay stuck. That's the whole problem. Okay, grief 
yes, you need to grieve. We need to do that. And what I always say is you learn to integrate the pain into your life. The pain doesn't go away, but you integrate it into your life and you don't become the victim. And then there's going to be a lot of people like me who feel like, wow, I believe I've had this transformational growth. So guess what? I want to give a message. I want to write a book or I, I, I want to become a grief coach like Robin. And actually they can, I'm going to be certifying. Just so you know, it's going to be coming out soon. I have a certification program. So if there's people that do want to become a grief coach, I will certify them oh, great. and they can open up their own business because that to me is the best way to help people. Cause I always say to myself, how, what can I do to best serve people? Yes, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching and I help people transform, but you know, that's a small segment of the population. And then you write books. Well, so many people are reading the books, but I feel if we have more bereavement coaches, grief coaches to help people, wow, that's gonna make a difference. Yeah, no, that, that will be huge. And we're going to take our final break uh, here. And I, and you mentioned it, and I, I want to pick up sort of with, with Jerry in 2019 and, and, and sort of where Robin is today and, and how you've folded that into, you know, really what is, what is a remarkable life so far. And with both, as I said, tragedies and, and opportunities. So when we get back, we'll kind of pick up there and, and, and then some final uh, thoughts and messages you have for the audience. Hi, welcome back to Mind to Heart with your host, Craig Richardson. We're in our last segment here with my guest, Robin Chodak, who's been telling us about some of the trials and tribulations she's been through and then how she's uh, made that or turned that into a wonderful spiritual awakening and, and now is helping others. And and Robin, before the break, you, you touched on on your, your second husband, Jerry, or um, second tragedy, I should say, and, and just maybe tell us a little bit about that and then and then where that's taken you you know since i mean they're fairly recent right within the last two years so yes yes I, I would like to talk about that because my husband was an amazing person first of all he was a doctor he was a great doctor and just an amazing human being and one of the reasons is a lot of women especially they when they're widowed they oftentimes don't find partners again. And one of the reasons is because the person coming in doesn't hold space or reverence for their loss and their love. And Jerry was able to embrace that loss with me. So, and, and, and as a suicide survivor, you know, sometimes you feel like damaged, like, oh my gosh, who is going to be able to deal with this and cope with this, okay? You've lost your spouse or your mate by suicide or your child. I mean, who's going to deal with that? But like I said, he was amazing and he supported me and he em embraced me and he, he really got to know Steve. Oh, wow. And it was interesting because I'm, I'm gonna digress just a little here because I'm very, very much into signs and symbols from our, de our deceased loved ones. Sure. And after Steve died, I started seeing the numbers 1111. 1111, okay. And, and, and I knew it was him communicating with me because he was a musician, a guitar yeah. player. Yeah. And after he died, I could not listen to the radio at all. It couldn't listen to music because music was a big part of our lives. And then one day a Beatles song came on and he loved the Beatles. That was like yeah. his favorite. And I listened to it. I couldn't believe I didn't turn it off. And I, I just felt this like presence in the room and I'm looking around the room and listening to the song and surprised I'm not turning it off. And then when it finished, I looked at the clock and it was 11, 11. Oh my gosh. And then I, I noticed it, okay? I wasn't making a connection at the time, but I noticed it. And guess what? The next day, 
a Beatles song came on and it happened again. And then every day since 2005, every single day, I've seen 1111 on the clock. Every day, never missed a day, all these years. And then I started telling my scientific husband, Dr. Chodik about it. And he thought I was a little airy fairy. Well, guess what? He started seeing 1111 every day. And to, to make the story very interesting, I can get in, there, there's an, a, an energy into numerology and I'm right, I follow sure. that. Yeah. And I didn't even realize until after Steve died that we married on 1111. I mean, I, I didn't pay attention to the numbers. We just married on a Friday night in 1995. We married 11, 11, 1995. So now when I met Jerry, my husband, and he's on this journey, this spiritual journey with me, and he's very cognizant of the numbers and we're both seeing them. I said, you know what? We need to get married on 11, 11, 11. So uh, now I have two, and this was really hard, the first anniversary. So my first wedding anniversary I had with two deceased husbands. Mm. So that was hard, but I guess in a way you can say you get it over in one day. <laughs> you know, you get the grief over in one right, day. Yeah, okay? you get the double whammy, but that's it. Yeah. Right. So as always, I always try to find that positive spin because I'm yeah, all no, about that's, reframing that's a good, our brain. That's a good way to look at it. Absolutely. Yeah, you reframe the brain. But so, so numbers are very, very important to me now. Since Jerry died, it was kind of weird because I wasn't seeing eleven eleven, and I was like, "What's up with this?" I just didn't understand it. Well, guess what? I started seeing three, three, three. Three, three, three. And that's why I wrote the book, which I had written three years prior. I wrote it three years prior that he died. It was sitting on my computer. After he died, after Jerry died, I realized that I need to publish the book. And it was right during COVID and it was called Three, Three, Must Have Connections for Inner Peace. And so now I'm seeing 333. Three, three. And if you study the meaning of the numbers, 333, three, three, when you see that, it means that your higher masters, your ascended yeah. beings are communicating with you and you're in the process of manifesting. So I see 333. Yeah. Three, three. I still see 1111 11 again though. And I see 333 three, three a lot. So my vibration is, you know, I'm in tune to this this non-physical connection with sure, absolutely no there's yeah. and the numbers are huge i mean pythagoras knew that i mean everybody okay. knew that i mean the the, the, the ascended masters uh, absolutely we you know it's interesting that that with jerry that he was a doctor but you were able to move him out of that sort of mainstream scientific thing and start to accept things i mean that's yes. Yes. i think we're missing we're missing some of that in our own uh schools of thought today unfortunately they we need to, we need more of the medical metaphysical Mm -hmm. And so you're doing okay then you've got, you know, a couple of years into now or almost into losing Jerry and yeah, it's, you know, again, it's, you know, this, this is what I would say, you know, to, 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 to the viewers, you know, when you lose someone, especially tragically, you, you just think your life is over. I mean, you, and, and that's understandable because you have this whole separation you know, the soul and the physical body and you just feel it everywhere and in and, and your hopes and your dreams and everything is just shattered. And you just feel that it's over and your life is never gonna be good again. But I'm here to tell you that it can be because I've done this not only once, but twice. And I, I do have to say that, yeah, I've learned so much that yes, knowing these things logically in my head definitely has helped me, but it still doesn't take away the heart pain. Yeah, you, you yeah. still have that pain, but I'm not doing the self-sabotaging things that most people do. Right, self-medication or whatever it is, yeah. Yes, I'm processing differently. So yes, our, our experiences in life constantly teach us. And so yes, I learned a lot from all of my tragedies. And yes, they have served me. But it doesn't take away the, 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 that loss and the love. But again, what keeps me going, and this is always what keeps me going, is my belief system. And that is my belief about love. That is my belief that I know that they're with me. The energy is there. They send me signs. Mm. So I, I'm very in tune with the non-physical. And everybody has this opportunity. I mean, we all do. I mean, I always say we are our own best psychics, okay? 
there's a knowingness. If we open up, if we allow, if we allow ourselves to quiet our minds and to listen, okay, listen to spirit, let spirit guide you. You know, it, it's the beginning of that transformation and you can, I mean, you can be happy. And you know what I always say, you deserve it. Mm. You deserve to be happy. Well, that's, 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 a, that's a wonderful message. And I was going to actually ask you, uh, as we have about a minute left or so, to wrap that uh, up what you thought. And I, I just think you just did it beautifully, that we, that we deserve to be happy. Uh, we have this intuitiveness within us. I think one of the things that um, these tragedies do is they strip away a whole bunch of other stuff. And you're left basically raw, right? And, and, it, and then at that point, it's... You, that's when spirit can come in and really, really work with you. Um, Robin, I want to really thank you for being part of my show. Um, it, you were a wonderful guest right along the lines of the kinds of people I love to have on here because it's all about journeys. Um, I really recommend that people, you know, track you down and, and find your, find your books and find you online. Uh, is there a website or something you can give us before we close? Yes, yes, absolutely. It's very easy. It's my name. Robin, R-O-B-I-N, Chodak, C-H-O-D-A-K dot com. And on my website, you'll find my books. I have three books. I have three. If you like to take online courses, I have three online courses on a platform called Udemy. And soon, if those who are interested in becoming grief coaches, stay in tune with me and sign up for my email list. And when that certification is ready, you can... If you're so called to do so, you can become a bereavement coach as well. And I just thank everyone for just joining us here. And I wish you much love and happiness on your journey. Thank you. Great. And thank you all for joining. I appreciate it. God bless. Thanks for listening to Mind to Heart with me, Craig Richardson. My path has led me from the Protestant and Catholic churches as well as studies in alchemy, mediumship, Eastern philosophy, and most recently, Edgar Cayce and transpersonal psychology. As an intuitive life coach, I am ready to guide you to an amazing life. For more information about me, visit craigerichardson.com.